Welcome to season three of Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artists series. I'm Frances Littman, your host, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. Today, we have an incredibly rich program with a variety of esteemed guests to share their vast knowledge about Canada's water policy and what it'll take to make our water resources more secure. We'll take your questions live closer to the end of the program, so please feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you have a question uh, that you would like answered. And if we don't get to your question for whatever reason, we've run out of time or what have you, we will make sure that we get those questions answered and post them with the video replay. So introducing today's guests will be Mace Rosenstein, a celebrated Washington DC lawyer and constitutional expert with vast experience advising media and telecommunication companies on complex strategic policy, legal and regulatory matters. Welcome back, Mace. Thank you, Francis. Um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm your official interloper. Um, and before we turn to today's substantive presentations, which are going to be incredible, as Francis said, I first wanted to share some free associative thoughts about truth and water. Water. Water everywhere. And all the boards did shrink. Water. Water everywhere. Nor any drop to drink and every throat through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. We'll come back to those lines, uh, but first, here are some inconvenient truths about water. The fresh ground and surface water accessible to humans accounts for less than 0.2% of all the water on Earth. That amount has been relatively stable since the end of the last ice age 12,000 years ago. But worldwide, per capita water consumption has increased sixfold over the last 100 years and continues to rise about 1% each year. Well, what does that mean? It means that today, roughly 2 billion people don't have access to safe drinking water and that nearly 2 million people die annually as a result. It means that 3 billion people lack adequate facilities to safely wash their hands at home. It means that 4 billion people, half the world's population, don't have access to safe sanitation services. And then consider this. The average American directly or indirectly consumes about 1,600 gallons of water per day. Of course, that includes you know, flushing the toilet and soaking in the shower and watering the lawn. But then there's the 20 gallons of water pumped out of an aquifer to irrigate the wheat that made the two slices of bread in your sandwich today, or the 52 gallons it took to produce your kid's glass of milk, or the 600 gallons it took to make your quarter pounder with cheese, or the 2,800 gallons it took to make one pair of blue jeans. Meanwhile, climate change is aggravating the already bad situation in water-stressed regions and generating new stress in regions where water is still abundant. Water quality is being adversely affected by higher temperatures and reduced dissolved oxygen content. And ecosystem degradation not only is leading to biodiversity loss, but also is negatively affecting water-related ecosystem functions, such as water purification and carbon capture and storage. Well, what does this have to do with Sir Walter Raleigh? Bear with me. In 1595, seeking to win Queen Elizabeth's favor, Sir Walter set off up the Orinoco River in search of El Dorado. Having imagined a stately Thames-like affair, Sir Walter instead found an impenetrable complex of shallow graded channels, none of them navigable by his clumsy ships. As their provisions rotted in the heat, Sir Walter and his men felt as if they were drowning in the saturated, humid air. 
their English broadcloth adhered to their skin, which itself began to mold and stink. In the end, after two voyages, all Sir Walter had to show for himself were a few pieces of gold looted from a Spanish garrison. Having failed to deliver on his undertaking to the crown, Sir Walter was interrogated at Westminster before his head was chopped off and his blood trickled into the Thames, which leads us to a truth of water. As Sir Walter learned on the Orinoco and Carlos Thermin Fitzcarrald on the Urubamba and Joseph Conrad's Mr. Kurtz on the Congo and John Houston's Charlie and Rose on the Ilanga and all the other pilots of delusion before and after them. The river, the water, is not for our taking. It takes us. And like Coleridge's ancient mariner, one who places himself outside of nature instead of realizing and accepting and celebrating that he is just one participant among countless others in a tapestry of incomprehensible complexity and beauty is doomed to choke on the soot of his delusion and hubris. I tell you, it's gonna rain, it's gonna rain, you better get ready and bear this in mind, God showed Noah the rainbow sign, he said it won't be water, but fire the next Well, Bob Sanford uh, needs no introduction, but he gets one anyway. Uh, Bob, uh, a frequent um, participant in these programs, is chair of the Global Water Futures at the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, and an award-winning author and editor of more than 35 books. He's going to guide us through the rest of today's presentation. Bob? Well, thank you very much for your always thoughtful observations, Mace. Water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. Well, something we clearly want to and can avoid in this country. And we look forward to further episodes of Mesa's Climate Corner in, in future webinars. Clearly water matters here in Canada, and that's what we want to talk about today. Despite the great pause brought about by the pandemic, we find ourselves at a moment of extraordinary opportunity for positive change. If there's ever going to be a transformational moment for the way Canadians value and use water, it is now. And that's what we want to talk about in the first part of this webinar. So there'll be two discussions today. The first will focus on the pending creation of the Canada Water Agency, a, a step in the evolution of water policy in Canada that we need to take if we are going to address issues related to water security uh, and uh, uh, take advantage of what we skills we have now in the coming decades of what is turning out to be an increasingly challenging century. So we have three prominent experts on water science, governance and policy in this country who will introduce us to what it will take to complete the structuring and initiate the function of a Canada Water Agency. John Pomeroy is well known to everyone in the water community. He is the director of the Global Water Futures Program the largest water and water related water research program in the world. It has been referred to as the Manhattan Project for Global Water Resources. Dr. Pomeroy will outline the current and pending threats to water security in Canada and how a Canada Water Agency should be structured to meet the water challenges Canada will face in the remaining decades of this century. So please go ahead, Dr. Pomeroy. Thank you so much, Bob. It's a uh, pleasure to speak to this group again. What I want to speak about is how the Canada Water Agency might address the threats to water security that are imminent in Canada. So first I will outline some of those threats and then it will go through how uh, the Canada Water Agency might be able to move quickly to address some of them. And, uh, and also to outline that we are in a water crisis and this is a crisis that we can solve. First, to remind this group that water is the basis for all human and natural life. And it is the activity that regulates the, the climate. Um, uh, of course, uh, we are water and water is our food, our energy, our industry, supports our communities, our ecosystems. And in Canada, water is frozen for part of the year. 
um, as you go up in the high mountains of British Columbia, the massive snow reserves and glaciers are an iconic aspect of British Columbia that support its lakes and rivers. Um, but these are also very sensitive and subject to climate warming. And so that creates vast problems in the uh, mountain west of Canada. But throughout the country, the uh, temperatures of our lakes, their, uh, uh, their algae content, the permafrost in our north that sustains the landscape, the, uh, the, the vegetation and agriculture, the possible, all this is related to the water climate coupled system. And it is changing rapidly. Uh, the uh, the world is warming rapidly. So uh, since 1948, uh, we've seen a temperature rise in uh, in Canada of almost two degrees, and uh, and the north is warming faster than that average. So we already have rapid warming over much of Canada, but northern Canada in some places has warmed up in excess of five degrees Celsius for winter minimum temperatures. This is. Um, associated with changes to the future. And, and so depending which climate uh, change scenario we choose uh, for the future, RCP 4.5 is a, uh, a future where greenhouse gases uh, are under control to some degree, and we have some control over this. RCP 8.5 is the trajectory that we're on right now of ineffective greenhouse gas controls. But we're seeing warming in these by the end of the century of, of anywhere from uh, three to seven to nine degrees Celsius above what we have already experienced. And that would create an unrecognizable country, uh, one that because of greater evaporation would be much drier, would have a much shorter winter, a much longer fire and flood season. And because warmer air holds more water, we can also expect much wetter conditions in the future. And so precipitation under the uh, scenario where we have ineffective greenhouse gas controls uh, increasing uh, anywhere from 20 to 50%, depending what part of the country that you're in. And we're already seeing a greater concentration of our precipitation events in multiple day storms that cause multiple day large scale floods, such as hit Calgary, the prairies or British Columbia or New Brunswick or Ontario or Quebec or the North in the last few years, virtually all the country. The other aspect that we need to be aware of is that Canadians, we haven't managed our water particularly well. We, um, we, we have vast reserves of water, of course, but a lot of it's in the north and it doesn't flow very quickly. But we've also, uh, we put our communities in floodplains. We've uh, uh, regulated our rivers for hydroelectricity. We've allowed runoff from our farmlands and our industries to contaminate our lakes. Uh, we've developed energy in such a way that we put our water supplies at great risk across the country. Uh, we put mines in places in the headwaters where we never should have. And as a result, uh, we have water problems across this country that the rest of the world scratches their head and thinks, how can Canada be in that situation? Well, this part is certainly of our own making and we can do better than that. Let's take a tour of Canada and look at the water crisis across the country. You'll see that the crisis is manifest in every part of our country from droughts on the prairies to floods in the in the mountains to wildfires throughout northern Canada to disappearance of rivers due to glacial retreat in the Yukon thawing permafrost in the north drinking water problems across our First Nations from coast to coast uh, long term water advisories that still remain to be lifted in many places. Uh, serious floods and water quality problems throughout southern Ontario, southern Quebec and the Maritimes. So no part of the country is free of this. We are in a water crisis. So fortunately, the government of Canada has uh, proposed a solution to this. And, and that is the Canada Water Agency. Uh, of course, water is a split responsibility between the federal and, and provincial territorial governments, and we need to bring Indigenous nations into the water discussions and management. But this is a great start uh, to bring greater federal leadership on water. It was mentioned in the speech from the throne in the budget of this year, and uh, many across the country think that the Canada Water Agency could better create and mobilize the knowledge we need to predict and respond to our water problems and opportunities. 
We think it could strengthen transboundary management. Our provincial and international boundaries uh, do not follow the river basins. And so we have to share waters with the Americans and with ourselves in better ways. We need to reconcile uh, water uh, and strengthen reconciliation with Indigenous people much better uh, to implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in Federal Water Law and Management. And we need to improve our collaborative river basin managing management and planning across the country, invoke environmental flow regimes and provide for better soil and water conservation. So these are great thoughts and there have been tremendous discussions going on across the country, uh, partly led by Environment Canada about what a water agency could be, but where are we now? Well, um, 2019 was several years ago and it feels like a world away. Um, we have this water crisis now. The, the floods and droughts are hitting every year. We have imminent drought in the southern prairies in southern Ontario and Quebec right now, but we still don't have a Canada Water Agency. And um, so I feel that it's, it's great to continue to discuss it and to plan for the future. But in the meantime, there's things that we can implement right now. Many elements of the Canada Water Agency exist within Environment Canada, and uh, such as flood forecasting, water quantity measurements, water quality measurements, water research, and transboundary agreements. And these could be as a first step, simply collated into a nascent Canada Water Agency. That agency then, could be tasked with uh, leading the consultations on its final design and supporting parliamentary studies on renewal of, of uh, water acts uh, relating to water. The agency as a matter of first priority could also start to expand its flood drought and water quality predictions across the country, uh, develop the first comprehensive water data system by bringing water quantity and quality data together into a common database uh, that's available to help us assess our problems and prepare for urgent upcoming transboundary agreements on the Great Lakes, the Columbia Basin, the Mackenzie Basin and then develop uh, water strategies for two areas of tremendous water stress, the prairies and the Great Lakes St. Lawrence. And then finally, coordinate national research in support of these priorities and to address the growing water crisis. So I'm an optimist. I say, well, you could do this by five o'clock this afternoon. It's a simple reorganization to, of existing capabilities and then start to consider how we might expand and move forward. Um, I know it's difficult, and uh, particularly in these times of pandemic, but I think we have to be brave and we have to uh, think brave thoughts. And we need to because we're at an incredibly important nexus uh, for the future. Um, do we deal with the future of contentious water management, intractable problems for ecosystems, infrastructure, hydroelectricity, and water supplies? Um, or do we choose a future where we can create and mobilize the knowledge we need to solve the problems of the water crisis and strengthen our water management to avoid our disputes, adapt to climate change, reduce flood risk, preserve ecosystems, and grow the economy? So uh, I think you know where I'll stand. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for uh, listening to these thoughts. Well, thank you very much, John. Our next panelist is one of the country's great water champions and given his other responsibilities, he has to be one of the busiest uh, elected officials in the country. Terry Duguid is the parliamentary secretary responsible for the creation of the Canada Water Agency. And without his superhuman commitment to the creation of the agency, we wouldn't be where we are now. And as he is in the middle of question period, we're lucky to have him, however briefly on this webinar. Thank you for joining us, parliamentary secretary. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Bob, for that always generous uh, introduction and for your amazing uh, leadership on, on water over many uh, decades. And it's, of course, great to be with all these uh, esteemed uh, uh, presenters today. Uh, uh, folks, I'm, I'm uh, delighted to join you from uh, Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. And let me begin by thanking uh, Creatively United and the Gail O'Riordan, uh, Climate in the Art series for hosting this uh, timely webinar. And I'm getting uh, very used to uh, virtual conferences like uh, so many of you, but when it, uh, when it comes to Victoria, this time of year with the cherry uh, blossoms uh, in, in full bloom, I would very much uh, like to uh, be there in Victoria in, in person. Uh, folks, uh, we will get through these uh, challenging times. We we know it, uh, it has been a real challenge, not only on the waterfront, but uh, uh, on the public health front. Uh, and as we do, 
uh, discussions like today will help uh, us to ensure that on, on the other side of this, we can all enjoy a, a more green, a healthy, equitable, and prosperous future. And I think all of you know this, uh, no resource is more important to, to that future than clean, uh, fresh water. Uh, Indigenous people have understood this for millennia. Uh, they have long honored water as sacred and protected, uh, integral to their rights and way of life. And I believe that uh, Canadians, by and large, share a deep connection to their environment and that we are an environmentally conscious nation. And that's a good thing because there is an incredible responsibility that comes with uh, having the third largest freshwater supply in the world, 20% of the world's fresh water. And uh, in all parts of the world, climate change is posing significant issues for the sustainability and availability of fresh water, as we have heard. Uh, water rich uh, countries like Canada are not exempt. And we are facing persistent ongoing pressures such as climate change high population density, pollution, and other threats, challenges that, uh, that threaten our ability to properly manage one of our most valuable natural resources. In British Columbia, you face uh, freshwater concerns such as understanding and adapting to the impacts of climate change on water quality and quantity, managing surface and groundwater use demands, and the protection of aquatic ecosystems. The vast nature of our landscape not only means challenges vary by region, but this also adds complexities to freshwater management in Canada. Addressing them can involve multiple jurisdictions and cut across many departments and agencies, and resolving them requires collaboration. And that's why the Government of Canada is delivering on its commitment to work in collaboration with Canadians to create a Canada Water Agency, an agency that will work with provinces, territories, uh, municipalities, indigenous governments and stakeholders to better manage and protect our precious freshwater resources. By establishing the Canada Water Agency, the Government of Canada is not embarking on legislative or regulatory changes. Um, it is seizing the incredible opportunity that a Canada Water Agency presents for greater collaboration in Canada to protect and manage our freshwater resources sustainably. And working with Indigenous peoples to ensure Indigenous knowledge systems are included in the work of the Canada Water Agency is a significant priority. Because uh, we recognize Indigenous people as the original stewards of the environment continue to be leaders in water protection. Last uh, December, as, as many of you know, we launched consultations on a discussion paper to engage Canadians on the role of the Canada Water Agency in freshwater protection, and we invited Canadians to provide comments online. I'm delighted to say that uh, the enthusiasm has been tremendous. It led to six regional freshwater forums that we held earlier this year. Uh, some of you participated in the British Columbia Freshwater Regional Forum, along with our minister, uh, uh, Jonathan Wilkinson. Uh, that was held on uh, February 16th via Zoom online. Uh, overall, more than 2,000 Canadians participated in the Canada Water Agency discussions. We, we heard many perspectives and views on the potential role of the Canada Water Agency, and we are currently analyzing the public and stakeholder uh, input that we received and we expect to release our What We Heard report on the discussion paper very soon. In the meantime, I think you might find it informative to, uh, for me to share a few of the larger issues that were raised at the BC session. Uh, first of all, we were, we were really struck by how passionately panelists spoke about the key concern of climate change impacts on fresh water. Uh, participants also uh, voiced concern about the water supply in general, the possibility of overallocation of water resources, and the need to balance ecological and human needs for water. And importantly, we all gained a greater understanding of how water is central to reconciliation with uh, Indigenous peoples. It was emphasized uh, by many that uh, participation must go beyond engagement, collaborative action, and joint decision making are also needed for freshwater management, and we take that to heart. I encourage you to uh, keep an eye out for the What We Heard report and take a moment to read through what was said. And uh, just uh, winding up now, uh, you know, the Canada Water Agency, uh, 
is a priority for this government. Last December, our Strength and Climate Plan underscored the importance of the new agency to ensure uh, our water remains safe, clean, and well-managed. And Budget uh, 2021, uh, as, as Dr. Pomeroy said, it was introduced last month, that uh, provides $17.4 million over two years, starting in 2021, 2022, that's this year, uh, to Environment and Climate Change Canada to support work with provinces, territories, Indigenous peoples, and key stakeholders on the scope of the agency's mandate, including identifying opportunities to build and support more resilient water infrastructure. Uh, freshwater security is certainly vital for the health of Canadians, for the environment, and for the economy. And I have uh, high hopes uh, for the Canada Water Agency. The discussions uh, taking place today will help us move forward in this regard. And all of you taking part uh, today can contribute to keeping our waters safe, clean, and well-managed by sharing your knowledge, uh, your experience, and your perspectives on freshwater challenges and opportunities for the Government of Canada. So I thank you uh, for all your good work and, and I hope I'll be around uh, for a few questions. I do have a, a vote at the end of question period. Uh, so if we don't want an election, uh, I better go take that vote and, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, we live to fight another day. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Pardon my Mr. Secretary. And, and thank you for all you have done to give the Canadian Water Agency its life our third panelist is, is also renowned, not just in water circles, but for his political experience and wisdom and legendary public policy scholarship. The honors he has received are too numerous to list. Suffice it to say that Dr. Tom Axworthy has been a senior advisor to successive Canadian prime ministers and is held by many certainly to be a great Canadian. Your thoughts, Dr. Axworthy. Well, uh, thank you, Bob, and thank you, uh, Terry. Mace uh, began by uh, quoting uh, Sir Walter Raleigh, and uh, as our uh, colleagues uh, will know, uh, Raleigh was uh, beheaded for his efforts, uh, which is a, a salutary example, I think, for political advisors everywhere uh, in terms of the kinds of advice they give. Now, we've heard from John Pomeroy about uh, the severity of the crisis, it is not in the future, it is happening right now. And we've heard uh, from Terry Duguid, Member of Parliament, that uh, thankfully, the uh, current government of Canada has uh, seized the priority of uh, water and is uh, working um, on structures um, to try to make the situation better. Uh, the points that I would like to make really are uh, two. The, the first is on the urgency of the issue. And, and urgent is often um, absent when we have detailed policy uh, making. The, uh, uh, both often politicians and public servants live for a quieter life and, uh, and uh, urgency requires that you have to take chances and uh, risks, and some of the ideas may not work out. But are the risks of not doing anything uh, greater than the policy risks of perhaps moving too fast? I think in water, they certainly are. And, uh, and John has spoken about it that when we look at uh, the nefarious impacts of climate change, we know it is not just for our, uh, that our children and grandchildren will face it. We are facing it now, the terrible impacts, most profoundly in uh, floods and um, fires and droughts. Those are a direct impact of climate change. So therefore, while we have to work on decarbonization, uh, at the same time, we have to respond to the immediate and present threats that are occurring because of climate change. And uh, it was not so long ago that the uh, city of Calgary was inundated with uh, floods. Uh, my, my home province of Manitoba, uh, right across the prairies, in interior of British Columbia, are facing droughts 
uh, which cost multiple billions of dollars uh, just a few years ago. And forest fires were so uh, great in Fort McMurray uh, that the major city had to be evacuated. The forest fire threat in British Columbia is enormous. Some people think it might be like California. So uh, these are tremendous threats right now. And therefore, uh, uh, Pomeroy, John said, you know, by five o'clock this afternoon, he would like to have people working in a coordinated way in a structure around the Canada Water Agency to begin to do something about them. I think he's entirely correct. Uh, we, um, we cannot uh, sit on our uh, laurels that the priority has finally been set while the problems are upon us. People will be losing their livelihoods um, this summer because of the effects of climate change, uh, around, particularly around drought and flooding. And ladies and gentlemen, we are the only major nation, I think, in the OECD, certainly in the G7, which doesn't even have a national flood forecasting service. We don't even have that. <laughs> um, we don't even know how much water is in our underground aquifers. Just this week in Ontario, this important city of Collingwood said that it was going to be stopping all development because of the lack of water. Uh, and yet at the same time, Ontario has been allowing companies like Nestle's to go into the aquifers and to take the water out and put it into bottled water. Well, we, there's a reason for that because we haven't yet mapped the underground aquifers in Canada. Now, just think about that. We don't know how much water we have. We don't know what the quality is. And yet we're making a whole series of policy decisions right now, uh, which, which would be affecting future supply. So, uh, John Pomeroy is right. The crisis is right now. Terry Duguid is right. The current government is showing a real commitment and a priority. What we need to do through Creatively United and other groups and the public is to say the time for study is over. The time for action is right now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Axworthy. And I want to thank all of our experts. And, and a number of key points uh, stand out. Water security in this country is becoming more tenuous due to climate change and increased demand by a growing population. The country needs a Canada Water Agency to orchestrate collective action on matters on, of concern to all provinces and territories, none of which can uh, address all of those needs by themselves. To the great credit of the federal government, considerable progress is made, but we do not need two more years of study to make an agency functional. We know how it needs to be structured and we know what it needs to do and its funding is in place to do it. And we certainly don't need to wait for another election. The creation of the agency was promised in the last election. There's nothing standing in the way of fulfilling that promise now. Now there is another uh, reason for moving quickly and, and uh, uh, Dr. Axworthy and Dr. Pomeroy both touched on it. We face a pending drought threat across the entire country this summer that could turn into a national emergency. And we need the advanced forecasting and prediction capacity and coordination that a Canada Water Agency can marshal together to deal with this pending crisis and related crises we know that we're going to face in the future. We need to do this now. Action needs to be attached to this $17.4 million envelope. We know what to do, we have to do it. The entire water community in Canada has come together in support of creating this agency. We have given it our all, and we hope Minister Wilkinson, that having brought us so very far, that you can help us cross the finish line. Now, it's my pleasure to give the floor to John O'Riordan and his guest, an expert on water law and a driver of water policy reform in British Columbia, the indefatigable Oliver Brandis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. It's a wonderful pleasure for me to introduce Oliver Brandis to this program. Oliver, thank you very much for joining us. Oliver is the director of the ecological of the uh, Polish Institute for Ecological Governance, which is centered at the University of Victoria in the Center for Global Studies, and certainly an expert on water resource management and governments in BC. So it's very important to get a provincial perspective on the water crisis and what uh, can be done through a Canada Water Agency. Through his work over the many, many years that we've worked together, he has been very instrumental in shaping 
uh, BC government policy on water and recently it's been instrumental in setting up a new initiative called uh, Watershed Security Strategy and a Watershed Security Fund. So Oliver's going to present some of his ideas around the strategy and fund and maybe I can start Oliver by asking you what are the drivers, what are the risks that this uh, new strategy is going to address? Thank you, John. I am uh, coming to you, of course, from the Colquitt and Washonic territory, and I'm thankful for uh, where I get to live and, and play. I'm going to share some slides with everybody, try and address your question. And I think uh, the preceding speakers have done such a wonderful job of setting up our conversation. And I think it's easy to talk about the water crisis and uh, watershed security or insecurity as we're facing as a global problem and it is indeed a global problem and we know all the reasons and we have all the facts, but I think we really need to understand that it is a manifestation local. It's actually a collection of local crises that add up to a global problem that adds up to things like persistent pollution, drinking water crisis, over allocation, invasive species, conflict everywhere. And not surprising, we see that in BC, we also have these problems and this accumulation of local problems become very real, very concrete because we not only have his history or the legacy land use practices often related to poor forestry, but also development ignorant or unaware of the hydrologic impacts. We see climate change amplifying and I often joke with Bob, we talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse being this fire, flood, drought, unsafe water, and they manifest and they're showing up. So these are the challenges that we need to deal with. And we know uh, a good example, John and I have been doing some work and certainly Polis has been doing some work in a place called the Coxsila River. It's a beautiful uh, system near where I live on the west coast of British Columbia in Cowichan Tribes territory. And the concrete problems are very real. We have too much use. You have unregulated groundwater. You have poor historical ongoing forestry and land use practices that are diminishing the salmon, diminishing fish. You have fish that have to be trucked upstream. And you see the impacts in a very real way, not only for the indigenous nations, the impact on couch and tribes and their ability to do cultural activities, the heritage and cultural aspect of salmon, the impact on sacred spaces, but also the farmers facing a crisis as uh, water has to be shut off. And we know no water, no food. And further, the economy, the local economy as the mill is impacted. And so we see the tendrils of a water crisis play throughout. So Oliver, in finding solutions, we always have to say, what are the goals that we're trying to achieve through uh, a more secure water supply. So maybe you can address what are the goals and how do you see them being uh, met by this new strategy? And, and that's, I think, uh, right on, John. I think what we see is a response, which is a recognition that water is part of a larger system called a watershed. It's an integrated system. Water is a very natural integrator, uh, both on our landscape, in our ecology, but also in our social systems. And this slide, this picture should show you these three critical interconnected pieces. And this is the underpinning of what a watershed security strategy begins to look like in British Columbia. What we see is reconciliation and the human justice, the human rights component of how we engage our indigenous partners. We see the obvious connection to stewardship and climate change, of course, but the often underutilized or underemphasized aspect of the economic the economic recovery, which is front and center in a pandemic world, but also the economic aspect of thinking about water not as just an environmental policy. We know from evidence from all around the world that if we treat water as an environmental policy, we almost always fail. But as soon as we situate water as part of a larger whole, as part of our ec economic, our community uh, health, our prosperity, we begin to see some success. And when we talk about the economic piece, we're talking about jobs and economic growth, certainty for investment, and the flip side, the avoided costs. When we think about water, we talked about flood forecasting or drought response, we have avoided costs that are very significant. Uh, some simple examples are 
for every dollar invested in flood mitigation, we get an estimated seven to $10 saved in post-disaster recovery. We know that in BC, uh, 2017 alone cost us 73 million. How could that money be spent elsewhere or how can we future-proof? So to your question, John, how does watershed security interlink? I think we have a good understanding about keeping water on the landscape, but we also need to think about in the economy. Of course, indigenous nations think about water in a whole different way, and it's fundamental. Water and environmental flows, that's the life pulse of a river or a lake, is fundamental to indigenous rights. Hunting, fishing, the obvious direct ones, but of course also about self-determination. And without water, you cannot get to uh, reconciliation. Without a serious effort at co-governance and protecting water, reconciliation becomes impossible. And a final thought on this topic, John, is the idea that watershed security is this integrated space. You see the three circles on this diagram, and those three circles are about the three dimensions that we need to think about when we talk about watershed security. There's a quality and quantity component, of course, that's obvious. We need good, clean, abundant water that's available. We also need to think about how it integrates on the landscape. Activities uh, up, the uh, watershed up the source, things like forestry can increase turbidity, have direct impacts both on the water and the function of the watershed. And the missing piece often is around governance, how we make those decisions. Who makes those decisions? We make many land-based decisions while not paying attention to the water impacts. And so the other pictures, all the success that that begins to look like. When you get to watershed security, you have salmon in abundance. You have a development that can also match uh, the hydrologic cycle. You have a restorative economy as we begin to fix some of the watersheds. You have co-governance and monitoring to understand the issues, all the topics we've talked about today already. So any successful strategy has to have to deal with the core issues and also have to have some resources and funding and manpower to make it uh, an effective strategy. So can you comment on what are the core issues that you're going to address and what kind of fund is needed? And maybe you can conclude with what do you think is your big idea to make this a very successful water security strategy in BC? Yeah, and so I think understanding the drivers of change and some of those future reality becomes central to this conversation. Um, we know, I think, pretty well from a policy perspective what the drivers are. We have commitments to um, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People called UNDRIP, and we know that co-governance is going to be, we know that the policy landscape and fabric is changing. But we also have sometimes some of the negative. We have a declining natural capital and rural economic instability, so driven by conflict. This is a driver. Those uh, cumulative effects, often a bunch of small decisions create the impacts. And of course, we have a growing complexity in the climate. Um, you know, from a, a driver perspective, of course, we have a public health uh, emergency that we need to respond to, but that relates to the economic recovery. And once again, that's where water and healthy functioning watersheds become central to create that security, that certainty for investment, that certainty for growth. Um, if we're gonna be serious about carbon neutrality by mid-century, we're gonna to have to start thinking about the carbon piece, but also the water piece. We know that climate will never be better than it is now. It will only get more challenging. Water in all its forms will be more varied and insecure. Adaptation and captured carbon will become the high value commodities. That's what we need to invest in, both in our public institutions and as individuals and communities. Adapting and creating a landscape that can absorb carbon. This is where we talk about a whole of watershed approach. Current forest and land use policy will need to shift. Take a simple example. If we're gonna to get to conservation 30 plus percent by 2030, we're gonna to have to fundamentally shift our landscapes. Soil, watershed, management, this will have to shift from a carbon source to a carbon sink through regenerative agriculture and forest practices. The future focus will be about security, resilience, and adapting. And that's where the policy, the provincial actions will drive. And we can talk about some of those specifics in the question period, but also the investment, both of the federal role, we've talked about the Canada Water Agency and the provincial role 
and the investment needed on the landscape where communities can both plan and put their rubber boots in the streams to fix the function and health of those watersheds, whether we're talking about wetlands, riparian areas, whether we're talking about source protection for drinking water and the direct health impacts. For me, as you know, John, it really comes down to a question of better governance. We know that the public communities, every listener on this um, session today knows intuitively that protecting water and watersheds is some mix of that expertise in science, and we've had some real illuminaries already share with us, the role of traditional knowledge. We know that we also need rules and enforcement. The pandemic and the response has shown us that importance of both planning and the rules needed to follow through. And of course, as I talked about in my opening, if we agree that this global crisis is actually a series of local responses and local manifestations, citizens and local control, co-governance become fundamental. That is really one of the missing bricks in our approach. We need the planning to think ahead, but we need some of that control. And you know, to that end, we have a big idea. It doesn't sound that big, but getting the federal government more involved, that's one piece. That's the Canada Water Agency and the ensuing law and institution reform that needs to happen down the road. But in BC, we have a very clear example. I know we all in BC feel very fortunate with the way uh, the pandemic response has rolled out under our provincial uh, health officer, Bonnie Henry. And what we can see, if we agree that the watershed security crisis is of the same caliber or the same, uh, same impact, we can think about a provincial watershed security officer modeled on many of the same principles. A provincial watershed security officer brings credible science evidence base, ability to rapidly respond. Can you imagine if we could have, maybe not daily as we get in BC on our health crisis, but a monthly update. What's the state of our watersheds? What's the state of our waters? Where are the crises? Where are we gonna respond? That gives us that ability to move to action, just as Dr. Tom Axworthy talked about. We don't need more plans, we need those actions. We need somebody who can break down the silos, Water is both a glorious opportunity because it connects to all the issues of the day, but it's a challenge because everybody thinks somebody else is responsible. And you know, any good public uh, policy, any good legal or institutional approach requires accountability, requires oversight. And so the uh, provincial watershed security officer might not do everything, but they ensure that it gets done by the appropriate ministries or the appropriate local government or the appropriate uh, institution and make sure that there are rules that we follow and that citizens can engage. Well, thank you very much, Oliver, for your time and expertise. And I have to say that I can't think of anyone better than yourself to be the first provincial water security officer. So you make a fabulous uh, person in that role. So thank you again for your time. Francis, over to you to deal with the questions and answers. Well, here, here, and thank you to everyone for these amazing presentations. So I'm jumping right into questions because we have very little time left and I'm going to address these first ones to um, Minister Duguid because I know you have to go. So this one's from Francis Deverell and the question is, will the new water organization demand that mining companies respect the water in their area and prevent the terrible pollution that now occurs in mining situations? Uh, well, thank you uh, for the question. Um, again, uh, and I, I don't want to get into the morass of, of federal and, and provincial jurisdiction, but uh, you know, there are things that uh, provincial governments and federal governments should be doing now. Um, you know that that's that's a detail. I think we'll have to have to consider. I mean, the the role of the Canada Water Agency will be to better coordinate, collaborate. Uh, it is not intended to be a regulatory agency. That that is going to be done, uh, hopefully through a renewal of the Canada Water Act and and other uh, measures in in water. But uh, we we think. Uh, the first pillar in, uh, in, in better managing and protecting our water from the, from the federal end is going to be establishing the Canada uh, Water Agency to work, uh, again, across disciplines, across governments uh, to, uh, to get better results on water. 
Thank you. And here's another one. This one's from Lynn Walford. Thank you, Mr. Duguid, for your optimism on the protection of our fresh water. While you mentioned who is supporting you, there is no mention of private industry as a stakeholder. What influence does gas fracking and oil pipeline lobbying have on the Canada Water Agency? <laughs> well, the Canada Water Agency isn't, uh, isn't in place uh, yet. And, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, again, I, I would go back to that sounds like a regulatory agent, a regulatory matter, uh, which is dealt with by um, Environment Canada and by uh, by other uh, agencies. Um, uh, and those issues, uh, you know, should be dealt with by by appropriate uh, authorities. I'm not sure what uh, what role the Canada Water Agency will will will. Uh, be involved with the, with the, those kinds of, of, ma of matters because we are in the process of designing its its uh, structure and mandate. And uh, Francis, I wonder if I uh, because I probably will have to go. Maybe uh, I want to respond to some of the challenges that uh, I think the other speakers have thrown thrown at me. And maybe I could just make a, a brief comment before I have to go. But I felt a little bit like Sir Walter Raleigh, who uh, might might lose my head at uh, at the end of this because I am uh, I am the government uh, guy. But uh, just for some. Uh, 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 context and perspective. You know, this, the Canada Water Agency was put forward as an idea in our platform in 2019 by one uh, Ralph Goodale, who I think may be on uh, on the webinar uh, with us. Uh, it made it into the throne speech and now in the in the budget. And as my old environmental science professor used to tell me, the most important uh, document environmental document is is not uh, environmental policy or the impact statement. It is the budget. So the Canada Water Agency will be established uh, and it will be established in the very near future. And it's certainly my belief that uh, 2122 is gonna be a very, very significant and transformational uh, moment. Uh, and there's a, uh, just winding down on this, there's, there's a, a, a very important confluence of events. The renewal of our, our freshwater programs is happening next year. It's the 25th anniversary of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and it will be the year that the Canada Water uh, Agency is, is formally established. It's like vaccines. We have to be a little patient. And uh, very, very importantly, uh, the provinces are, are very important actors here, and we're taking great pains to bring them aboard because the watchword, uh, as, as you've heard, is collaboration. And so a number of the questions have been uh, aimed at regulation, uh, we, will, we will get there, but the Canada Water Agency's uh, primary role is going to be getting everybody together on the waterscape and landscape to better manage our, our water resources. Thank you, Minister Duguid, and thank you so much for your time. So please, we'll let you go and make your important vote, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll it's return been, uh, to the questions now. It's been great to uh, to be with you and uh, thanks everybody for a, a lively session. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, and moving right along, there's several questions here. Um, I'm going to ask this one from Ken McDonald. Urban stormwater runoff is the primary cause of impairment of Canada's streams, lakes, and marine environment. Why is so little attention being paid to this critical problem? Well, that's right in my wheelhouse of some of the uh, more localized impacts. And I think it's a good comment. I, I don't know that that's um, exactly accurate because it's a concentration problem, meaning in urban centers, that is true. That is 100% true. In urban centers, we see this problem. And it really relates to, I think, the larger shift we need, which is the notion that when we think about development, when we think about where we uh, situate our communities, where our cities grow, we have to think about the hydrology and historically for the last you know 500 years uh, we haven't done that and we now need to shift and and one of the very easy and immediate opportunities and we see it in some cities where we're creating the incentive so they're using financial incentives with a, a backstop of some regulatory requirements where we're requiring certain amounts of land cover you basically have to have on site a requirement that it flows, the amount of water that comes in is the same amount of water that goes out. And then you have to clean up that water. And I think there's a lot of very good examples from bioswales and natural systems that can help us do that. 
but it requires us to invest in that kind of green infrastructure, nature-based solutions. And that's a shift in how we spend our infrastructure dollars from the gray concrete to the green natural systems that actually do the work much better, much more resilient, and are really the only answer when we're talking about a shifting climate world. So I agree with the comment that that's where we need to go. We just need uh, incentives for our municipalities, our cities, our local government to really institute that at a wide scale rapidly. Thank you. And Oliver, while you're at it, just a quick one. Any comments on why the Ministry of Forest, Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development in BC should continue to accumulate management responsibilities for timber resource extraction, land use management, water protection, water sustainability, while under a mandate to maximize timber harvesting? That question's from Eve Main Rand. Well, they have nailed that one right on the head. When you have the Ministry of Alphabet Soup, you run into a problem. Um, I know our friend, uh, Dr. Tom Axworthy knows this well. You need a, a mix of accountability and the ability to focus. Politicians at the end of the day, even the good ones are only people. Ministers can only wrap their minds around so many topics at once. And so you have these giant ministries that really is about maximizing the extraction of wood fiber. That's what it does. And all that other stuff happens after. Well, I tried to make the case that we have to juxtapose that, that in a period in our lifetimes, we're going to have to shift to not maximizing the extraction of wood fiber and ministries, and they're all the same across all the provinces, resource management ministries need to be looking at it a mixed value, not just the forestry for what it could be as two by fours, but what does it do for standing forest, for carbon? What does it do for water uh, purification? What does it do for mushroom harvesting, for food systems, and the list goes on. But that integrated piece is central, and it is something that the I believe the watershed security strategy can drive in British Columbia, perhaps as a beacon for other places. Well said. Um, this one from David Spence, the global human population is almost 8 billion people. How do so many people impact the use of water? And is it reasonable to expect that uh, the human population just is going to outdo our outstrip our resources? I, I can speak to that one if you wish. Um, it doesn't have to. Unfortunately, we're seeing all sorts of intervening factors that make uh, tensions like this absolutely inevitable. And one of the things that we're finding as a result of the pandemic is that uh, we're getting into situations now where people are having to leave drought areas, drought impacted areas and other places where water is an issue. And uh, they're becoming extraordinarily vulnerable and these events are taking longer to unfold. And we're finding refugees are uh, permanently on the move and we're uh, and increasingly vulnerable while they are. And so these kinds of tensions are going to be a second order problem associated with climate change that we really don't mean, have the means yet to begin to address. So we're seeing second order issues emerging on top of the direct physical impacts of climate change that are gonna require our attention. And we learned a lot about dealing with multiple climate, multiple impacts during the pandemic. And we're gonna to have to learn to deal with uh, multiple crises simultaneously as uh, the decades proceeds. Okay, I, there are just far too many questions for us to answer today. So I am going to make sure that all our uh, presenters today get these questions and they will be answered with the video replay. I wanna thank you all so much for um, your presentations. If there's any last comments, um, I'd love to we'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I'm just going to go on and tell our audience about our final webinar of season three. Anything that anyone wants to jump in? Oliver. I I just really want to amplify uh, Dr. John Pomeroy's point. I think the idea that we can both plan and strategize properly, but also follow through on the actions. We have like a generation, 20 years of very clear, no regrets actions. He's identified them. Dr. Tom Axworthy has done it. Bob understands them. We need those actions. Our politicians need to be reminded. Our leaders need to be reminded. We can walk and chew gum. We can both plan and strategize, and we can make sure that we're forecasting floods, we're preparing for droughts, they're inevitable, we're beginning to look at watersheds as integrated sources, not just lumber, the themes go on, but we can do that, that is definitely within our abilities. 
Bravo. Thank you. You're all so eloquent. I, we could listen for hours to this conversation. So we'll obviously have to do this again. And for our final webinar of season three on Wednesday, May 19th, we are honored to feature best-selling author and award-winning public relations professional, James Hogan. James is a tireless advocate for ethics and public discourse. And his latest book, I'm Right and You're an Idiot, The Toxic State of Public Discourse and How to Clean It Up is being championed as an effective tool to cut through the toxic smog of adversarial rhetoric, propaganda, and polarization so that we can overcome our resistance to change and resolve our collective problems. James Hogan will be joined by guests, including Ella Kim, a volunteer policy analyst for the BC Council for International Cooperation's youth-led climate change branch, who will share how youth are trying to move the climate change dialogue forward and why it matters. So please be sure to join us. And just a reminder, please help support the forest campaigns noted here. Because as we've heard, forest soils uh, have a lot to do with water. And in fact, I just want to quickly share that if you haven't seen the fantastic fungi movie, this is one film that will really convince you why we need to be saving our forests and our resources. So thank you to all our presenters and to you, our audience, for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to just share a final quote, if you're willing to stick in there. This one's by Thomas Berry. The natural world is the larger sacred community to which we belong. To be alienated from this community is to become destitute in all that makes us human. To damage this community is to diminish our own existence. See you in two weeks for our final webinar of the season. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Bye for now.